Well, we are continuing our message series about sayings not found in the Bible. And today we're looking at God helps those who help themselves. I'm not going to take, well, I'm not going to take a poll or a quiz. You already know the answer to that. But if I went out and asked people on the street, they might say, yeah, that, that's, that's in the Bible. God helps those who help themselves and basically it is um, it's a half truth and we'll see we'll see in a moment as we get there now the truth is God reaches out to those who cry out to him and what God wants is he wants us to admit that he is the only source of help and without his help we are sunk or drift, or on our own. And so this is the fourth message, and no, that's not in the Bible. We're looking at these popular statements that people say or think are in the Bible, but really aren't there. You know, here's the thing. We have thousands of, of, of Bibles in all these different translations, but for some reason we're not reading them or we're not... We don't know our Bibles. Now, George Bonner, bon, Barner does research. What he looks into specifically is the state of the American church and culture. And he did a survey, and some of the interesting beliefs that people have is 65% believe that the Bible answers all or most of the basic questions of life. That's good. But 44% believe the Bible, the Koran, and the Book of Mormon all teach the same truth. They don't. 60% of Americans can't name half of the Ten Commandments. 63% can't name four, the four Gospels of the New Testament. 31% believe that a good person can earn his or her way into heaven. 81% believe that God helps those who help themselves is a direct quote from the Bible. You may know the name Bill O'Reilly who used to have a, a TV show on Fox News Channel and it was called the No Spin Zone. And in January 2002, Bill O'Reilly was interviewing the pastor of the 5th Street Presbyterian Church in New York City. O'Reilly told, Bill O'Reilly told the pastor, Jesus would have demanded that the homeless people shape themselves up or else. Because we all know the passage, the Lord helps those who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves is it found in the Bible. I mean, it sounds good, doesn't it? But there's three aspects to this biblical misquote. The half-truth is, number one, God won't help you if you're lazy. See, most of the biblical misquotes that we have do, do, do contain a certain amount of truth. Because after all, a, a broken clock is right twice a day. And, and so there's some truth in this saying. Now, this saying probably comes from Benjamin Franklin, who published it in Poor Richard's Almanac in 1735. But most likely, it's probably a misquote of an Aesop's fable that tells the following story. A wagoner was once driving a heavy load along a very muddy way. He came to a part of the road where drive where the wheel sank halfway into the mud and the more the horses pulled the deeper sank the wheels so the wagoner threw down his whip knelt down and prayed to hercules oh hercules help me in my hour of distress hercules appeared to him and said man don't sprawl there get up and put your shoulder to the wheel the gods help them that help themselves and here's the truth god helps those who help themselves is seldom spoken in kindness or in a in a nice way it, it's usually spoken as a harsh statement telling someone to get up from their pity party 
and get to work. Now, the reason it's a half-truth is because the Bible does teach that God won't bless laziness. I used to, I used to intern at a, at a church. It was interesting. And, and it, it was a downtown church, and of course there was a lot of homeless people, a lot of people that would come. And, and they would feed the homeless, but before they would give them a, a microwave meal, they would have them go out and clean the parking lot or rake leaves or, or something like that. And where they got that from is what Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses, verses 10 through 12. In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. Verses 11 and 12. For we hear that there is some among you who are idle. They are not busy, but busybody. Now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus to work quietly and provide for themselves. One of the reasons Paul wrote this, uh, just, a, just a quick snapshot, is people expected Jesus to return right away. So what they did is, is like a lot of cults, is they would get together and, and they just pray, and, and that was it. They were waiting for the Lord to return because Jesus said he's going to return quickly. Unfortunately, they neglected everything else. And Paul says, no, you can pray, you can worship, but you've also got to be willing to work. And so, you know, if you need a job to feed your family, well, yes, you should pray and ask God to give you a job. Then just don't go and sit by the phone and wait for the phone to ring or somebody to call you out of the blue and offer you a job. The first thing we need to do is we need to pray. But then you got to go out and you got to knock on doors or, or put in application. And that's what Jesus meant when he, when he told us to ask and seek and knock. We are to be searching for God and God's will and what God wants us to do. We've all met biblical freeloaders who are the reason that we have this misquote. And here's the thing, laziness is part of our sinful nature. God blesses people who display initiative and energy. I mean, if you've ever watched ants at work, you'll agree that they're busy little creatures. And in the book of Proverbs, God uses the tiny ant as an example for us. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Go to the ant, you slacker. Observe the ways and become wise. Without a leader, administrator, or ruler, and I didn't put verse 7 or verse 8 in there. I have to do a better job of proofreading. It prepares its provisions in the summer. It gathers its food during the harvest. How long will you stay in bed, you slacker? When will you get up from your sleep? And so the Bible praises the ant because the ant is always working. If you've ever had ants in your house, you know that for sure. They come in, they find whatever they, they like to eat, and they take it back to the, the, the queen. Well, there was a children's teacher that was using the, this verse from Proverbs in Sunday school one day. And, and she said, boys and girls, every day the ant gets up and it goes to work. Every day the ant works hard. And in the end, what happens to the ant? Little Johnny raised his hand and said, it gets stepped on. And that's true, somewhat. Well, here's the lie. We had the half-truth. Here's the lie. Self-help is the best help. And, and, and that's a dangerous statement because it promotes the value of self-help or doing things yourself. Now, some people say the whole self-help movement began with the book, I'm okay, 
you're okay. You've, you've probably seen that book because they still sell it. But actually it goes, it, it even goes further back to, to uh, a couple other preachers and such. But I'm Okay, You're Okay was written by Dr. Thomas Harris in 1967. And if you go in any bookstore, they have a large self-help section or self-improvement section. And you'll find hundreds of book titles devoted to helping yourself. Help yourself think and grow rich. Create your own destiny. I believe in me. I haven't seen that one before. Ten stupid things women do to mess up their lives. I haven't seen this one either. Try Plato, not Prozac. And, and you know, Americans are willing to spend millions of dollars to buy books that they think will give them a secret way to help themselves out of their problems. The problem with these books is it, it reinforces self-centeredness or it, it puts the focus on me instead of seeking the one who truly has the power to help. And see, self-help books and seminars are designed to give people more self-assurance and self-confidence. It's not always a bad thing. But the problem for believers is believing in self-help can and will lead you away from God. And, and so there's two dangers of, of spiritual self-reliance. <coughs> the first one is self-reliance makes you arrogant. Professional heavyweight boxer Muhammad Ali, he never lacked self-confidence. He, he was always known to look at the TV cameras and shout, I am the greatest. As the story goes, one time he, he boarded a plane for a trip and the flight attendant told him to buckle his seatbelt. And Ollie said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And without hesitation, the flight attendant said, Superman don't need no plane either. So buckle up. And so here's the problem with, with self-reliance. We end up creating our own self-centered universe. Me, myself, and I. I mean, you can see it today among most sports stars and celebrity. The world revolves around them. In fact, they think because they're rich and famous and a movie star, we should listen to their opinion. But contrast that with the Bible that says it's God that gives us the ability to accomplish anything. If you ask a successful person, what is your key to success? And he may answer that he worked hard and he's smarter than other people. Well, contrast that with what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability has gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant he swore to your ancestors as it is today. See, we need to be careful to give credit where credit is due. The Bible tells us in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, in the same way, you who are younger be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. In other words, we're all the same. We're all in the same boat. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then there's this warning in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, against self-assurance or self-confidence. He mocks those who mock, but gives grace to the humble. And the second problem is, is self-assurance or self-confidence makes you forget your dependence on God. See, if you believe that God helps those who help themselves, you've probably convinced yourself that you can handle most situations on your own. And if you believe that, the only way that you think you, you have to bother God is, is when 
you're in the really tough situations. But see, God isn't looking for people who are self-reliant. He's seeking people who understand what it means to deny themselves and depend on him for everything. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, we read this. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. The exact opposite of self-assurance, self-confidence. See, some people think that they can trust in their muscles, that they can trust in their skills, or they can trust in their, their smarts. So they really don't need God. You know, we, we sang that, that old great hymn that says, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own or yourself or other humans. See, God helps those who help themselves. It's a lie that may lead someone to think maybe God really needs our help instead of us needing his help. There was a woman in the Old Testament who apparently believed that God helps those who help themselves. Her name was Sarah. Her husband's name was Abram, later changed to Abraham, and they were a childless couple. Yet God had given Abraham this, this promise that he would have a son, and one day his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, if you want to look it up. And Abraham believed God and told his wife, Sarah. So they started hoping and believing that they would have a child. But they weren't a young couple. Abraham was in his 80s and Sarah was in her 70s. Not the age of most couples um, planning to have a newborn. And when she was unable to get pregnant... Sarah decided to take matters into her own hands. You know, remember God helps those who help themselves? She decided God needs a little help here. So she came up with a scheme to produce a son. And you can read about this in, in Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Abram's wife, Sarai, had not born any children for him. But she owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Sarai said to Abraham, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave, perhaps through you I can build a family. And Abraham agreed to do what Sarai said. You can almost see the, the wheels turning in, in Sarah's mind. God's promised us a child. And it's the Lord's fault that I'm barren, so I'll just help God out. I'll just let my maid have a child. And since Abraham will be the father, then the, the promise, God's promise will be fulfilled. Well, Hagar really didn't have much any say in the matter. And she became pregnant by Abraham. She despised Sarah. The son born to Hagar was named Ishmael. Thirteen years later, when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, she gave birth to a son. They named him Isaac, which means laughter, because Sarah had laughed when she heard the angel say that she would be with child. Here's the problem. Ishmael Ishmael became the father of all the Arab people. An angel told Hagar Ishmael would be like a wild donkey. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. He will settle near all his relatives. Genesis chapter 16, verse 12. Arab Muslims trace their lineage all the way back to Abraham through Ishmael. The Jewish people trace their lineage all the way back to Abraham through Isaac. And much of the warfare and the killing today between the Jews and the Arabs 
can be traced back to this bad decision Sarah made almost 5,000 years ago. If only Sarah had waited on God and trusted his promise. Instead, she believed that God needed her help. See, when we try to take things into our own hands and help God, the result is usually painful. It's usually not good. What happens is our plans become substitutes for God's plan. And the question is, is what are we going to learn? God doesn't need our help. It's a lie that God helps those who help themselves. Don't believe it. Here's the truth. God helps the helpless. Those who think they have enough power to help themselves will try, and they will not seek God's help. But the Lord responds to those who cry out to him for help. Do you need God's help today? Here's two ways that we can find help from God. God helps those who admit that they are powerless to help themselves. That's not as easy as it sounds because we don't want to admit that we're weak or that we need help. It's especially hard for men to ask for help. That's why men are notorious for getting lost and not stopping to ask for directions. Men don't want to admit that they need help. And in our culture, we, we admire a self-made man. We are a, a do-it-yourself society. But when it comes to salvation, you can't do it yourself. You've got to admit that you are a sinner and that you need help. The fact is that God helps the helpless, the undeserving, those who don't measure up, those who fail to achieve his standard. Unfortunately, most people see themselves as masters of their own fate or, or captains of their own soul. But we've got to admit that God is our only source of help. And without it, we're sunk. Compare the statement, God helps those who help themselves to the words that are found in Psalm 94, verses 17 through 19. If the Lord had not been my helper, I would soon rest in the silence of death. If I say my foot is slipping, your faithful love will support me, Lord. When I am filled with cares, your comfort brings me joy. And when David wrote this psalm, he was about to die. And he was helpless to do anything about it. And if God had not helped him, it would have been all over. That's the same type of attitude that we need to bring to God. You know, when we, when we sang, Hallelujah, what a Savior, in, in the third verse, it, it talks about how helpless we are without Jesus. Guilty, vile, helpless we, spotless lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be, hallelujah, what a savior. Are you willing to admit that you're guilty, vile, and helpless? Only then will you find that God helps those who admit they are helpless. And then we need to trust Jesus alone for help. See, God is not one of several sources of help for you. He's the only source of eternal help. David wrote in Psalm 121, he wrote this, verses one and two. I lift my eyes towards the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Now, if you look at this in the original Hebrew, grammar in this psalm makes it clear that David is asking a question. Literally, does my help come from the hills? No, my help comes from the Lord. Now, whether David was camping out as a shepherd boy or as a soldier, he knew the hills were full of danger. Enemies, these wild animals come from the hills. But he knew God wasn't sleeping, that God was watching over him. So what is it in your life that keeps you awake? What dangers are around you up in the hills? The Psalm says, go ahead and trust him. There's no reason for us to stay up at night worrying about it. 
God never gets sleepy. God never snoozes. He's watching over us so we don't have to be afraid. So the next time you hear someone say, God helps those who help themselves, you need to answer, not so. Because in truth, God helps the helpless. You know, the beginning of the, of the 20th century was, was an interesting time for the world as we know it today. Back in 1859, Charles Darwin introduced the theory of evolution. Now remember, it's just a theory, it's not law. It's still a theory. He wrote his book, The Origin of the Species. And his, his, his theory was gaining popularity. Many po people believed that social evil evolution existed also. And so there became this belief that, that humankind was getting better and better. And that eventually hu humanity's evolution would result in utopia or heaven on earth. It's supposed to be a time of peace and progress and endless promise. And then the, the industrial revolution started in full swing. And there seemed to be no end to what technology could accomplish. You know, the, the, the telephone, the, the airplane, the light bulb, the, the horseless carriage all started to come about the first few years of the 20th century. And then in early 20th century, there was construction of what was to be the greatest ship in history, the Titanic. It was the biggest, fastest, most luxurious ship ever built. And when it was dedicated May 31st, 1911, one of the employees of the White Star Line, the owners of the ship, were, was overheard to say, even God himself could not sink this ship. Never mock God. And on her maiden voyage, Captain E.J. Smith sped along at 22 knots, 25 miles an hour because he had no reason to fear anything like an iceberg. I mean, after all, he was, in an, he, was, he was on an unsinkable ship. But as we know, it wasn't unsinkable at all. And so on the night of April 14th, 1912, the Titanic sideswiped an iceberg and it tore a 300-foot gash in the starboard hull. The unbelievable thing about the Titanic is that while it was built for 3,000 passengers, there was only enough light bolt, lifeboats for 1,000 passengers. That's the height of arrogance. Lifeboats un, unnecessary on an unsinkable ship. And within two hours and 40 minutes of striking the iceberg, the unsinkable ship slipped beneath the ocean surface and settled on the bottom of the North Atlantic. 745 people survived in the lifeboats and 1,528 people lost their lives because there was no lifeboat for them. It was human arrogance that killed the passengers on the Titanic. Here's the thing, our world is much like the Titanic today. We're, we're plunging full steam ahead. The music's going, the people are partying, unaware or unconcerned about the icebergs dead ahead. And sadly, the Titanic was the personification of the self-confident attitude that says, I can do it myself, nothing can stop me. I don't need God. He's, he's nothing but a crutch, nothing but a lifeboat. But the truth is, all of us need a lifeboat, and his name is Jesus Christ. And if you place your life in him, he will carry you safely over the waters of eternal judgment. But to do it, you have to admit that you're helpless without him. And trust him with all your heart. Because remember, God helps those who admit that they are completely helpless. And the truth is, God died for the helpless. Amen. Let us pray. Father, 
Help us to put our trust in you. It's not ourselves, it's not others. Only you are the one that can save us, help us, change us if we trust you and believe in you. So help us to do that this day and every day. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Don't forget in the back will be stuffing Easter eggs with candy. If you could stay, love to have you. Thanks.